Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here to find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one in my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I Sin runs deep, your grace is more, the grace I found is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness in Christ in me. Where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness in Christ in me. Lord, I Teach my song to rise to you When temptation comes my way When I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay When I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay. kids you guys can go ahead and follow your teacher miss shelby down to your class and while they're doing that the rest of you are invited to go ahead and get around and say hello to someone this morning
you. Good morning. Welcome to True Life Church, where we guide people to take the next steps in their relationship with Jesus Christ. Everybody has a next step to take in their spiritual journey, whether it's growing, belonging, or serving. If you're not sure what your next step could be, um, you can see Jeff at our cafe after the service, and he will gladly help you figure out what your next step could be. Also, if you are new here, we have a lovely welcome gift for you. You can also see Jeff in the lobby at the cafe after service, and he'll get that gift to you. We are also a giving church here. We give 10% of everything that comes into our door goes right back out into our community to help people in need. So if you'd like to help us with that, we have our give box in the back there. You can give online at truelifemelbourne.com or you can mail us at 2190 Sarno Road. And now I hope you enjoy our lovely video today. All right, good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. All right, good deal. Um, we are in our series in Acts, and I uh, want to do a, just a couple of things uh, real quickly. First of all, um, David, thank you for taking pictures today. I'll just point right at him. Uh, it's been a while since our up, our website has had new pictures, so if you wonder what he's doing, that's, that's what he's doing. It's been last year since we have any stuff up there, so just pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. He's doing a great job. Um, also, a quick shout out to, uh, we got some faithful people who continue to watch online, uh, like Fran Wolf and Ed and June Davis, among others. So just hello online, some of our homebound and shut-in people who would want to be here in person and invite you to just keep praying, uh, to keep praying for them and, and their well-being and their health and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, again, we are in a series in Acts, and last week we were, started off chapter 10, and it's going to set us up to where we're going today. And then also for next week. Uh, and just a couple of quick things from last week. First of all, um, we asked the question um, based out of the, the couple of guards that were sent from Cornelius to go visit Peter. And we're going to read that again this morning. Uh, their names aren't there. And we have to be willing, in a weird way, uh, and in a good way, be willing to be forgotten. Because it's not about us. It's about God. What God wants to do, what God wants to accomplish. It's about His glory. And we're living in today an age in which we like our name out there, where people are fighting tooth and nail through social media and other different you know, avenues to, to be famous, to have more influencers, to have more followers, and everyone's fighting for their own name. And I encourage you today, as last week, um, whose name are you living for? We have to ask that question. And for us, it should be Christ and Christ alone. Uh, secondly, are we a person of prayer? Because Cornelius and Peter, as we'll again read today, uh, were both spending time in prayer when these, this, these visions, two independent visions, happened for each one of them, uh, where God then brought their paths together. And just as encouragement, you know, these guys were regular in prayer. They were faithful in prayer. And most likely uh, at scheduled times throughout the day, specifically this 3 p.m., uh, again, we'll read in a little bit, and if you haven't put prayer on your calendar, I think you're missing out. I think if you're just praying intermittently, I think just right before the meal comes, if you have a, a, a time of your day where you say, at least for this moment, for this time, I'm, I'm going to be a person of prayer. And so we asked this Christianese phrase, how's your prayer life? And it's going to take a while to break that habit I don't know if you've ever heard that question before, but we shouldn't have a prayer life. We should have life filled with prayer. It shouldn't be separate. Like we keep this over here and we keep, it's like, how's your soccer life? 
well, soccer life isn't that great right now. I fall down a lot, and then somebody comes over and flags me a yellow card. You know, how's your football life? That's getting ready to start. No, no, like, it's, we should be in that. It should be, how's your life, and is it filled with prayer? And Peter and Cornelius were both filled with prayer. They were prayer for people. So that was one of the walkaways from last week, hopefully for you. I was, and I'll encourage you again as we start off today. Uh, maybe you, you missed the boat last week. God is good. Here comes another one. And here we are. And we we're blessed to have today. And so let's start that um, with the reading uh, of his word. I invite you to stand for Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 16 is, is where we're going to, to read today. Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 16. Let's follow along together. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion household, gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? He said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. And the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry, and he wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. And he saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word for us. I pray that we are... Um, moldable, shapeable, um, that we are listeners of the word and doers of it, that it's instruction and, and what is taught today from this uh, would, would guide us into uh, more Christ-like actions, attitudes, and heart. And I pray that we are a part of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. God, thank you for today. Amen. I'm going to have a seat. I want to stop here really quickly. um, Because there's a few things that we're going to notice. Um, If we're familiar with the Peter... Um, uh, Peter, again, is the guy who got out on the boat and attempted to walk across the waves um, to, to meet with Jesus and, and sank, but was, was then lifted up uh, by Jesus. Peter's the guy who said, you know, I'm never, never going to leave you, Jesus. And Jesus is like, yeah, you will. He's like, no, I won't. Yeah, you will. No, I won't. You will. Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me. And sure enough, that came to pass. Three times he denied that he knew Jesus. And then later, three times, Jesus restored him. So here we see this number three come back again, and now it's presented to him in a vision. And this giant sheet in his trance, and this thing that's happening, it says the thing was then lifted up. So something is clearly going on, and I don't think it's just hunger pains. We know he's hungry, you know he wants to eat, and and that's probably a great time to have a food dream. But this is much, much more than that. Uh, it happens three times, and this sheet comes down, and there's a whole bunch of different things in it. So we're going to pick up in this story, and we're actually going to come back to this even a little bit later, so I don't want to leave off too far from where our scripture reading was. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him a second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. And then you can imagine the sheet comes down again. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. No, I have anything, Lord. 
What God has made clean, do not call common. And then again, rise, Peter, kill and eat. I've seen this before. Hmm. No, I've, no I've, I've not done any of that. Lord, what God has made clean, do not call common. So it happened three times, and then this thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, Behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house. Remember, there were two Simons. It wasn't just a Simon at a house. It was a specific house with two Simons in it. And this is how exact the, the vision that um, the angel had given to Cornelius uh, from God was. He said, you're going to go to a house, and that house is going to have two Simons in it. And you're going to specifically ask for this Simon. So here the men show up who were sent by Cornelius. And they stood at the gate and they called out to ask whether Simon, who is called Peter, was lodging there. Because again, calling out Simon, does Simon live here? Yeah. Well, it wouldn't have been enough. But the Simon who's called Peter, is he there? And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and he said, I am the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. And the next day he rose and he went away with them and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. And when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. Like, don't worship me. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. And he's going to get that from the vision that he had. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. And Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house, the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, Your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore we are all here in the presence of God, to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. We're going to continue and finish this out. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed, because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked him to remain for some days. And we're going to spend some more time in this in this chapter as well as the next chapter. Uh, and some more time in, in the vision is what has really come to pass. Because it's actually a lot to break down. And I don't want to... 
There's a lot of scripture here, and I don't want to not do it justice by just, oh, that's great, some people came to know Christ. Um, and that is great, but it's not just that. A few significant things have happened. First of all, um, you have Gentiles who the Holy Spirit has been poured out on. This was a new thing. Again, up until this point, all Christians, and they weren't even called that quite yet, but all followers of the way had been or were Jewish. They just believed in the Messiah, and that the Messiah was Jesus, and that Jesus had risen from the dead. All right, So you follow this natural progression through, and Peter, among other disciples at this time, were basically under the, the impression that in order to follow Jesus, you had to be a Jew first. You had to become Jewish before you became Christian. And this is important for us because as we kind of hinted at last week, few, if any of us in here, have or had been Jewish at one point. So that's good news for us, but this was interesting news for them at the time. And Peter's vision, he had a hard time understanding it. So he was sitting there as all this thing had happened on the top of the roof. The good news is, is that God didn't wait too long to explain the vision to Peter. It was an immediate, oh, there's a knock at the door. Oh, I just had this weird food trance dream thing. What was that about? Oh, oh, here it is. And it's clear that literally within a day or less, Peter knew exactly what that vision had meant. And that the Holy Spirit and the salvation of Jesus Christ was not just limited to the Jewish people anymore. And this is good news, right? It should be for us. All right? It should be. Well, why is this so important? Why is what we just read so important? Because there's a few things. If you've ever been in a grocery store, raise your hand. Yay. Okay, most of us. Some of you somehow haven't. That's okay. All right? That's, well, that's actually in the probably new generation. Just food just magically gets delivered to your door through some app. So yeah, you, you might not have to go to the grocery store. Anyway, if you're walking through the grocery store, there's like the meat and produce section, right? And then there's like a section within the section, usually around the hot dogs. It says kosher. And pickles that are kosher. What is that kosher? It's from the Jewish dietary laws, kashrut, all right? And there are three sections of kashrut, all right? You have kosher, which is the things that are good to eat, all right? You have trif, which is the things that are bad to eat. And then you have parev, which are the things that are neutral and can be eaten with anything else, all right? You have kosher, trif, and parev. Now, parev are the neutral things. It's like vegetables. Hi, I'm broccoli. You can eat me. That's okay, right? Um, it's pasta that has been washed thoroughly. It's rice, all right? It's grains. All right, cool. That's parev. Well, then you have kosher. Again, kosher is good things. Animals have to be slaughtered in a specific way, all right? And animals that have not been slaughtered, in case anyone's not aware, the chicken you eat was once alive, right? I might be a, a touch graphic here in a second, but... The cow that you just ate in a, in a burger was once mooing, okay? So just have that in the back of your brain, all right? This might be the message that converts everybody to veganism. I don't know. But animals have to be slaughtered in a certain way, all right? And, and the kosher way is that they have to have their throat cut with a, with a specific knife by a specific person who's specifically trained in kosher slaughter of animals, right? And then the blood must be drained out of that animal, according to the law that was the time. So no animal that has died naturally can be eaten. All right. So if you're walking through the woods and there's a deer, you, you keep walking. Number one, because it's a deer. Number two, because it had died in a natural way. You're now walking in a field and a cow has died. All right. You, you, pass, you pass the cow because it has died in a natural way. All right. So those are, that's how kosher animals have to be slaughtered. All right. Land animals to be kosher must have split or cloven hooves, right, and eat grass. This means that cows, good. Sheep, we can eat sheep, all right? We'll get there in a second. What is out? Pigs. Yeah, pigs. Horses, you ever had a strange desire to 
nay. You, you say nay. No, I've never. <laughs> right? If you never had that strange desire to eat a horse, nay. Um, so cows are good. Sheep are good. All right? Pigs are out. I want to let this sink in for a second. This means no bacon. This means no, this means no smor- smoked pork butt, pulled pork. Can't do it. That means what? How about salsa? Sauce, yeah, no sausage. No brisket's beef. Brisket's beef. Brisket beef. So I just want you to, I want you to think it's, I don't want to assume that just people know what is going on in this dream thing and why it's important, all right? So pigs are out. All right, seafood. Who likes lobster? You're all wrong. All right, lobster's nasty. Lobster's nasty. Lobster tastes like soap. It's gross. Um, for seafood, most, if not many, fish are, are acceptable, but not all of them. The fish must have, obviously, fins, so throw out eels, and scales. Not all fish have scales. Catfish, bad. All right. Uh, lane snapper, good. All right. Fish have to have scales and fins. Also excluded, no shrimp, no calamari, no lobster, no shellfish. Okay, if you're, a lot of you are just going to throw out animals. And if, and if they have skin, bad. And if they have scales, good. All right? Does tuna have scales? No, tuna does not have scales. What about sardines? Do you seriously eat sardines? This is, this is a separate question. All right. For birds, birds of prey, birds of prey. I don't know if you ever, again, had a hunkering to, to eat our national bird, but if you ever did, you know, want an eagle, no, it's not allowed. You can't eat an eagle, osprey, vulture, hawk. Only birds that don't eat other animals can be eaten, therefore making the chickens are good. The chickens are okay, all right? Meat and dairy cannot also be eaten together. Oh, yeah. If someone's really following kosher, kosher practices, meat and dairy cannot be eaten together. This means while beef is good and while cheese is good, you cannot combine them. No cheeseburgers. What? Right? That's what I said. Often, someone who's really practicing kosher will, will wait six hours before having one and then having the other. So if they ate beef for lunch and they want to eat dairy, they're going to wait for, for dinner. All right. So this is, these are the customs that Peter would have been holding on to. Right? These are the things that when that vision of the sheet came down, he said, no, 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 I'm, 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 I'm being a good boy. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm not eating these things. I'm abiding by this law. This is clean. That's unclean. This is clean. That's unclean. Pigs bad. Cows good. Sheep good. Chickens good. That fish bad. Shellfish bad. I've been doing these things. And yet the sheet comes down with all types of what? In it are all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. All kinds of different things. And there came a voice to him. Rise, Peter. Kill and eat. (gasps) What? What? No, I, I can't kill and eat because, first of all, even if it's an acceptable animal, I'm not permitted to be the one to slaughter it in this specific way. And so this whole vision that he had three times, the rise, Peter, kill and eat would have been like a giant, this would have been a nightmare, really. It was a vision. This would have been a nightmare in some ways for Peter. And I want us to understand a little bit about that, what's going on, all right? Because this was a big deal, and it might shine a little bit of light into some kosher practice. So next time you're walking by the aisle, you know, and you desperately crave a hot dog, first of all, choose the beef ones. Uh, anyway, uh, so just, it, it's important stuff because this was shaking Peter to his core. This is a big deal. And again, fortunately... For Peter and for us in the story, God didn't wait long for it to be revealed. It was the next day, and Peter's on this journey, and, and they're in, 
and verse 28. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is when he visits Cornelius' house for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. And that goes back, obviously, to verse 15. The voice came to him again the second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. And this is important. Because what is actually happening here is a few things. From this vision and then later in chapter 15, and we'll hold that to when we get there, and it's also going to be reinforced in Paul's letters, it's clear that we or the Gentiles who have come to the same saving faith in Jesus Christ, we don't have to become Jews before we become Christians. We don't have to follow the same dietary restrictions we don't have to have a requirement for circumcision, though many still do. We have no requirement for pilgrimages to Jerusalem. That would be a thing for us today if this was something that we still had to do, if this is how we had become uh, part of our faith. We'd have to go to Jerusalem like every year for the feasts and young men at specific times in their lives. We would have s sacrifices. Think about that for a second. We'd have keeping festivals. We would have to have our hair cut for some of us in a certain way or wear tassels on our clothing. Now, the key here is that what's going to happen because of this vision and then later in Acts chapter 15 and then also, uh, again, in some of Paul's letters, these things become not required for people to follow Christ. Not required. Can you follow the, Can you choose to be kosher? Yes. Does that mean you're not a Christian? No, not at all. You, you can choose to do things. Do you have to? No longer. What's also not on the table in this perspective? Well, God's law. It's different than the law given to Moses and the Mosaic Covenant, which is the law that, again, God gave to Moses, which has covered the things that we just talked about. That's found in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. The, the Ten Commandments, obviously, they're not up for a debate in this discussion about things we can pick and choose from. Nope. It's not on the table. Finally, this also doesn't default us to only follow the Ten Commandments, but also now Jesus, who is the fulfillment of the law, and now the New Covenant, which is another reason why those words are and should be important to us, because these laws, these dietary things of the Mosaic Covenant Jesus is the new covenant. Turn with me to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verses 17 through 24. And we've read this before, uh, maybe two months ago. Uh, but it's worth reading again, just for where we're at. Paul is writing now in verse 17 of chapter 11. But some of the branches were broken off. And these are the branches from the, the tree of Israel, right? The different tribes and the, and the peoples who used to be obedient to God were broken off. And you, although a wild olive shoot, a Gentile, right, out in amongst anyone else, because the Jews in their mind, they had Jews or Gentiles. Jews was anyone who was Jewish and around Jerusalem. Gentiles was literally like everybody else. It was a giant group. A wild olive shoot were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember that it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. And then you will, be, and then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. And that is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree. Now, we talked about, I won't go there right now, because we talked about that kind of in a good length, and we talked about the botanical, if you remember that, the perspective on that, and how you have these little things that actually this means a lot, uh, even as science is concerned. 
um, hit the nail on the head here. But what Paul's talking about in this letter to the church in Rome is how they have been grafted on, as we are, to be inheritors of the promise of Jesus Christ. And again, this is good news. The Jewish traditions of purity made it pretty much impossible for anyone to associate with Gentiles without becoming ritually unclean. Which again, why back in Acts now, it was a big deal for Peter to just go into Cornelius' house. For him to sit with him. For him to be around him. For him to share a meal. For him to stay in his house at the end. They stayed with him some days at the end of chapter 10. Jesus, who is the fulfillment of the law, is the new covenant. This is a new promise. This is a new day for even Peter. We, should, we are called to follow the entire word of God. The understanding of the Old Testament and why things like this are important, as well as who Jesus is, what he did, and how he taught us to live. You don't have to turn here, but really quickly, 2 Timothy chapter 10. 2 Timothy chapter, sorry, chapter 3, verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. Here we go. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You want to pick me up verse for you. There it is. Woohoo! Yay! That's tough, right? I want to read it again. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Are you exempt from that? No. Are you ready for that? Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from your childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. You know the scriptures. You might have grown up in a Sunday school class. You might have been here at a church or another church for a good while. You may have known these things for part of your life, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I want to invite you to turn to Mark. We're going to take a slightly different look, different angle for a few moments. To hopefully tie some, some of this together for us today. Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35. Mark chapter 4. And on that day when evening had come, he, being Jesus, said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And this is one of these little sentences that if, again, we're not thinking about why it's important, we will just read over and not think twice. I haven't gotten into the best part of the story yet. Right now they just got in a boat. Jesus said, Let us go across to the other side. Now, on the Sea of Galilee, there were two sides, two very distinct sides. You had the Jewish side, and then you had the Gentiles side. Jewish side being the east, Gentile side being the west. On the west was a group of ten cities called the Decapolis, all right, and that's where they're going to head off to. And if we're not paying attention, we don't understand the context, and if we don't even put ourselves kind of in the mind of Peter about kosher dietary restriction laws and things like that, we will, again, read a verse like this and be like, so what? Do you just want to go to the other side? The other side would have made the disciples' eyes bug out a little bit. Let's go to the other side. What? What? Over, over there? Yeah, let's, let's go to the other side of town. But there's Gentiles over there. Yeah, I know. Let's go over there. But we might be unclean. Let's go to the other side. 
I don't know if you've ever thought about that before, but that's what the other side meant. And that's why it's phrased that way. Let's go to the other side. Let's go downtown. <gasps> but downtown, that's where that is. Yes, we're going downtown. Let's go to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with him in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But Jesus was in the stern asleep on the cushion. This is how at peace he was because Jesus is peace, right? So he's back there sleeping. And they woke they woke him and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? I'm imagining like some of the disciples are bailing little things and some of them are just screaming, like, we're all going to die, right? And he's back there sleeping. And they wake him up. Don't you care? We are going to die in this tiny little lifeboat on the big sea. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Can you imagine being there? Like, wow. Like even the wind and waves listens to him, right? Demonstrating that, again, Jesus, the Son of God, creator of all, ruler of all, has the power over all. Stop, wind, done. See, still. The difference would have almost been night and day. Peace, be still. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear. And said to one another, who then is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. And so they came to the other side of the sea. Maybe now we're paying attention to it. To the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. I want to think about that word for a second. There met him with a man with an unclean spirit. And again, we think back to Acts, right? What clean, unclean, what God has made clean, do not call common, right? There's a man with an unclean spirit. Not clean, but unclean. He lived among the tombs. And this would have been a huge, I mean, this is weird today. Like, you don't have to go back 2,000 years ago for this to be weird then. It'd be weird today. If there was a dude just camping out in the cemetery, it, that would be very weird. And we would call that probably unclean. Like, we might not use the same words, but like, dude, there's a more sanitary place you could, you could probably live than out with the dead people in the, in the tombs, in the ground and things. He lived out among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore. He was strong, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. So this outcast of a man with a big problem is out there living in the graves and in the tombs. And night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. This isn't things that normal people do, right? We could definitely say... Even today, they would say, this man has a mental disorder. And be like, yeah. But it's more than that. It was a spiritual condition. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he, Jesus was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he replied, I always like to do that in my imagine, like, my name is Legion. You know, like some really creepy voice, you know. My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And if you didn't know, now you do. Are pigs clean or unclean? Unclean, all right? And a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs. Let us enter them. And so he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out 
and entered the pigs. And the herd numbering about 2,000. And when this little piggy went to market, and this little piggy went to school, 2,000 little piggies. All right, a lot of little piggies. 2,000 pigs rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. We're actually going to keep going. And, and the people came to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the formerly unclean one, who had had the legion sitting there clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. That is a changed life right there. It's a very clear before and after. What it's also a picture of is unclean to clean. And what is really going on as we kind of tie this all together is Peter, who had been here for this story, the light bulb might now be clicking on for him after that vision. Oh, oh, it's God who makes things clean. It's the Lord. It is Jesus who makes things clean. And this is good news, isn't it? This is the good news. This is the gospel. Is that we who were dead in our sin, unclean before God, through salvation in Jesus Christ, through repentance, through obedience to His Word, we are pronounced clean, healed, well. But I still have these problems, okay? You still need Jesus, okay? Because it's a daily walk. We're living in this day and age where Modern Christianity says to themselves, I said a prayer once in 8th grade. I'm good. Got my get out of jail free card. And when we read other scriptures, some will say, Lord, Lord, I'll call on my name. And he says, I depart from, depart from me. I, I never knew you. But didn't we do all these things? Wouldn't we do this and do this? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we have a homeless shelter? Didn't we have a social justice movement? Didn't we blah, blah, blah? Didn't we involve politics? Blah, blah, blah. No. no. Because it was never about that. It was about unclean to clean. It's about unsaved to saved. It's about disobedient to obedient. Unrepentant to repentant. And regenerate. This is the gospel, and this is the good news. And why this story should be also another layer of importance to us, because hopefully most of us here today are clean. Not because of what we have done, Paul writes that, but because of what God, through the, His Son, Christ Jesus, has done for us. This is the good news. This is the gospel. And so even stories like this, so Peter had a vision, so what? So good news! Because I can remember when I was not. And I know the mistakes that I made. I still make mistakes. I'm not perfect. But I am repentant. And I'm trying my best to be more obedient. It is Jesus who separates the clean from the unclean, not only on this side of heaven, but the other. You and I one day will face judgment. Whether or not you think about it, your life leads to that moment. One day, you and I will give an account for our life before the Lord.
clean or unclean. It's much more than kosher. In Galatians chapter 2, a few verses. Paul's going to call something out because of this. We're going to fast forward some time. Again, Acts chapter 15, this is going to be important for us in a couple weeks. And now we're fast forwarding even much more beyond that. Years, decades actually. Uh, and, and Paul's letter to the Galatians. But I want to pick up here in verse 11. And when Cephas came to Antioch, I, Paul, opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Because before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? And what Paul is calling out here is that, okay, some of them had come to the, around to the point later that it was okay to eat these things or be around Gentiles. Okay, and so they're eating these things and being around uh, other Gentiles. But then other people came into town and you're like, oh, just kidding, <laughs> I don't, I'm not doing that. So they were basically being one type of Christian around one type of people and being another type of Christian around another type of people. Being one person on social media, if you will, being another person in real life. Being one person Monday through Friday. But between Sunday, 10.30 and 11.52, being a different type of person. See where I'm getting at with this? There's a phrase out there, a saying. I could not find the author because it's been quoted and quoted. And Anyway, it goes like this. What you win them with is what you win them to. What you win them with is what you win them to. A couple examples for you. A young person growing up today might never have known a, live, a losing season of Alabama Crimson Tide football. They have no idea that that thing even exists. But before Nick Saban, this was fairly common. Oh, the good old days. Go dogs. All right, so... That's what they're used to winning. And guess what's going to happen when, when, not if, when one day Alabama doesn't have winning season after winning season after national championship after championship. You're going to have a lot of bandwagon fans who are used to winning, who've been told that's what to expect, not be fans of Alabama anymore. What you win them with is what you win them to. All right, what about for churches? Are we winning them with the good news of the gospel that we've just shared? Unclean to clean, salvation in Jesus Christ? Or are we trying to win them with vibrantly colored children's ministries? Youth game nights. Concert experiences on Sunday mornings. Now you know what I'm talking about. It's one of the reasons why we continue to make tiny little changes here at True Life Church. Because if you watch our live stream from, I don't know, four or five years ago, hopefully it's going to look very different from today. This is a good thing. What you win them with is what you win them to. Friends, we need to be winning people with the Word of God. Because all this other stuff is just stuff and it's going to change. What's modern now is going to be old-fashioned soon. What's popular now is going to be unpopular one day. 200 years ago, the only things allowed, allowed to do music in church was a pipe organ and a choir. And, and here we are. And where it's common to have guitars and band and piano and Cool things, right? We're not going to invest. That's not where the hope is. The hope is not come, hear our bands. The hope is not even come, 
Look at our ugly pastor. The hope is come, hear the word of God. Come, live the word of God in community with each other. And Paul calls that out even among Peter, there in Galatians chapter 2, and Cephas, and other believers who'd be like, they were going to be one way around one people and, and another way around other people. Kosher over here, and Thraif over here. And this is important for us today because I won't ask you to name names or look in the mirror. But you know that there are people who profess Christ who are doing exactly this. We started off this book in Acts, and I want to just turn back to the beginning of it for just a moment. Acts chapter 1, 6 through 8. When they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus, he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit, again, this is before Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you in the same Holy Spirit that became on Cornelius and his family, the Gentiles, and when this Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And you will be my witnesses. Not you will be my concert venues. Not you will be my marketers. Not you will be my meme posters. Of sometimes incorrect scripture verses misquoted on social media. No, you will be my witnesses. To be a witness is to have an attestin or a, 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 attestation of a fact or an event. Yeah, this happened. I saw it. I witnessed it. Two eyeballs locked on. It went down. I witnessed it. One that gives evidence, like in a court of law, specifically one who testifies in a cause before a judicial tribunal. Yes, I am a witness. One asked to be present at a transaction so as to be able to testify to its having taken place. One who has a personal knowledge of something or something serving as evidence or proof by public affirmation by word or example. We are called to be this. You will be my witnesses. How are we going to do that? Well, one of those ways is this point I want to close with. Don't be a Christian chameleon. Don't be a Christian chameleon. If you're unfamiliar, a chameleon is a weird, weird looking lizard. Little eyeballs that go out a little different, like a tongue and things like that. A chameleon, what does a chameleon do? It changes colors. God gave it the ability to change colors to blend in with its surroundings, like wherever it is. Now, friends, believers, we are called not to blend in. Rango, blend in. Not blend in, but to stand out. Did you ever put that, have you ever seen the movie Rango? Did you ever put that in the context before? He's, he's a what? He, he's a chameleon. So he just blends in to whatever surrounding he's in. He's out there in the West, so he becomes a little Western lizard. Don't worry, if you haven't seen the movie, I'm talking nonsense. You're like, what just happened? Blend in. Friends, we are not called to blend in. But by our living the word of God, naturally, we will stand out. Because the rest of the world, they're not doing this. So that's my challenge for us this week. It's my hope for us this week. That we would be consistent in our prayer. And they would ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in ways that you can de-chameleonize your life. I just made that up. <laughs> For us to de-chameleonize our life. Because we're either following Jesus or we're not. We're either being obedient or disobedient. There is no in-between. 
As we read earlier, anyone who really desires to follow Jesus will come under persecution of some kind. Now, I'm not asking you to run headlong into that. That will come naturally. That will come naturally. And it may come at a cost. It may come, you decameleonizing your life may come at a cost of friendships or relationships that you may have thought were important. But be a witness. Let your life serve as an example to show others. There's a lot of different people who say, oh, there's nothing but hypocrites in church. And that's what gives them an excuse to say that. Because there's been many, many people over many, many ages who have become chameleons, adjusting their life or even their beliefs based on where they were or who they were with. The good news is is that all, all are welcome before the Lord. And he is the one who pronounces clean or unclean. Let's be clean, right? Like I'm not saying let's go be kosher. Because I like a cheeseburger. I do. I love a cheeseburger. But friends, let's be clean for the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right. I want to close, speaking of clean and unclean, and a new covenant. And we're going to close out with communion today. We've been doing it every week, which I love. I hope you're not tired of it. I'm not. But it's another, uh, it's another reason why when we reflect and look on this, what Jesus did for you and I on the cross, was that, was that clean or unclean? <laughs> Absolute clean. Absolute clean because this a sinless Son of God in our place for our sin. Took the unclean from us because of who He is in us. Clean. And I don't know about you, but that puts a smile on my face. So I want you to invite the Holy Spirit to search your heart. If you've got something against a brother or sister in Christ, I invite you to fix that or remedy that before you coming up here. That's important. This will be here next week, or you can take this another day in your homes after reconciliation has been made. But for today, search your heart. Let the Lord search your heart. I invite you to take a few moments and forgive your, ask for forgiveness of sins before the Lord. Because He is the ultimate clean. Washed white is the phrase. Washed white in the blood of the Lamb. Which again is a clean animal. Another little fun fact, all that tying in together. I won't go back down the diet conversation again. But this is the good news. Christ has died. Christ is risen. We have the forgiveness of sins, unclean to clean, because of what he has done for us. Amen? So we've got the bread up here, because on the last night, when he was with the disciples, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you and for many. After the cup, after the supper, he took the cup, said, this is my blood of the new covenant, a new thing that I've come to do. Take and drink all of it for the forgiveness of sins. Blood poured out, body broken. And as often as we come together, and we are, do this in remembrance of me. So I want to invite you to remember him and to be thankful for the unclean to the clean. And again, this is the good news, right? Amen, amen, amen. Invite a couple people in the band to come up first because they're going to then lead us into a time of, of closing worship. The table has been prepared because our Savior has done what he came to do. It is finished. You're invited to come. Whenever.
to stand. From the far side of the chasm, you had me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. There at the cross, you paid. The dead I owe broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time I had home. Thank you, Jesus, for the
Never fail, you said fast. Your promises are true, you're faithful. You cover all my sins with forgiveness. My eyes have seen your ways, your goodness, love and faithfulness. Be Behold your glory, righteousness and peace, kiss heavens all around us. Spring up, oh well, living water rise within us. Spring up, oh well, Holy Spirit deep within us. Rise, rise. Fast. Your promises are true, you're faithful. You cover all my sins with forgiveness. My eyes are sealed with grace, your goodness, love and faithfulness. We, we behold your glory. Righteousness and peace gives heavens all around us. Spring up, the well, living water rise within us. Spring up, the well, Holy Spirit deep within us. Spring up, the well, living water rise within us. Spring up. Are we feeling it today? Are you feeling it? Come on, everybody. Here we go. See goodness in the land of the living. See goodness in the land of the living. See goodness in the land of the living. We'll see goodness in the land of the living. Yeah, we'll see goodness in the land of the living. Hey, hey. We'll see goodness in the land of the living. We'll see goodness in the land of the living. See goodness in the land of the living. Spring up, spring up, oh well, living water rise with. 
within us spring up. Oh well, Holy Spirit, deep within us spring up. Oh well, living water rise within us spring up. Oh well, Holy Spirit, deep within us rise, rise. trivia night on Friday. It was an awesome time. It was the best turnout we've had for trivia night. Congratulations to our winning team. The answer is C. <laughs> um, we, if you have any more questions from our business meeting that happened last week, all of our elders and Pastor Josh will be here at the church um, at 5 p.m., available for the next four weeks. So if you have any questions that you wanted to talk with them over, they will be here, so you can come and meet with them for that. And then tonight, we have our missions update from Travis and Jenny. Um, they went over to Asia a few weeks ago, and they're going to be giving us an update from our missions over there, and they'll probably have some cool pictures to show us as well. Yeah. Yes, and then next week we'll, we will be starting a new study for us Sunday nights. So that is tonight at 6 p.m. You don't want to miss it, and we'll see you guys there. Have a great week. Come and lost to love, Jesus.